Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. Um, okay, uh, Ramsey Bar- and uh, the beach refugee camp, that is a reference to the place where a deal was made, a handshake or a signature was signed, something uh, it, making peace and, and beginning at least the forging of a coalition government with uh, the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And, and what is the status of that agreement at this point? Well, the status of the agreement is that both parties um, agreed on the... Because it has a different constituency, uh, many of its supporters are quite religious, and they do not... Uh, necessarily, uh, uh, you know, they needed language that appeals to them at a different level. So they uh, provided a set of conditions that would appeal to their constituents, but at the same time, uh, the practical implications of it is that they too uh, are, uh, are willing to go for the two-state solution. And perhaps this is the real danger of the agreement as far as Israel is concerned responsibility, which usually means take it on the chin with some missile strikes and stuff in response, and, and, even and if it's somebody else that does it, right? So they're trying to and act you, like a responsible state as responsible prison guards inside the juvenile prison that is the Gaza Strip, basically, correct? That's right. And in fact, um, the second day, the second day to the signing of the unity agreement between Hamas and Fatah, Israeli forces uh, uh, conducted an incursion into the northern Gaza Strip perhaps hoping that Hamas would retaliate and then and then the whole propaganda war is going to start saying wait a minute you've just signed an agreement with a terrorist organization and and and, and so forth and so on so the, the whole pro, you know uh, provocation thing is very much related to um, to Israel's intention of constantly creating a Palestinian boogeyman uh, in the case of Hamas if Hamas manages to navigate itself out of that stereotype, again, it's going to be a very tough position for Benjamin Netanyahu, although personally, I think the Israeli government is very, very resourceful to worse. Yet at the same time, uh, Netanyahu and his Palestinian partner, whether it was Arafat, now Abbas, kind of really maintained this charade of being, uh, you know, peacemakers. Constantly meeting, shaking hands, and that sort of thing. Right. It, it kind of really. I'm sorry, I have to culture. stop you right there, Ramsey. We got to take this dang break here. Uh, their hard breaks built in, but uh, we'll be right back, everybody, with Ramsey Baroud from PalestineChronicle.com. One sec. Phone records, financial and location data, Prism, Tempora, X Key Score, Boundless Informant. Hey, all Scott Horton here for OffNow.org. Now here's the deal. Due to the Snowden revelations, we have a great opportunity for a short period of time to get some real rollback of the national surveillance state. Now, they're already trying to tire us by introducing fake reforms in the Congress. And the courts, they betrayed their sworn oaths to the Constitution and Bill of Rights again and again and can in no way be trusted to stop the abuses for us. We've got to do it ourselves. How? We nullify it at the state level. It's still not easy. The Off Now project of the 10th Amendment Center has gotten off to a great start. I mean it. There's real reason to be optimistic here. They've gotten their model legislation introduced all over the place, in state after state. I've lost count. More than a dozen. You're always wondering, yeah, but what can we do? Here's something. Something important. Something that can work if we do the work. Get started cutting off the NSA support in your state. Go to offnow.org. All right, you guys. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Ramsey Baroud, editor of Palestine Chronicle at palestinechronicle.com and a frequent writer at antiwar.com. Palestinian unity, hope and gloom in the beach refugee camp. And so, uh, well, let me ask you this. Now, Ramsey, and uh, I may be all over the place in this interview. I never know quite what to think about all this stuff. But um, I saw an essay by uh, a writer. Well, I don't want to get you in a fight with anybody. I saw an essay by a writer, a Palestinian writer, who says that 
the two-state solution really is just a trap. It'll only be, if, if it ever happens at all, it'll be one step up, maybe half a step up from the occupation as it exists now. It'll never be a state in the sense that any other nation state in the world is a state. Netanyahu has explained what uh, independent Palestinian state would look like to him, and it's just like the occupation, basically. Well, you know, Area C, security zones, etc., like that, and how ultimately if they did a two-state solution, in practice what it would amount to is legitimization of what is now considered by almost everyone on Earth to be completely illegitimate, and that is the permanent occupation of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. And so... Uh, what do you think about that? That it's such a, a half a loaf deal. It'll make it. Uh, it'll short circuit uh, real attempts. Attempts that that could create a, a more workable solution, a better solution of some kind, and and uh, replace it with uh, basically a, a status quo, a stronger status quo. That'll be uh, much harder you know, to dislodge. I, I, I do agree uh, with with his opinion. I think there are two realities here. One that exists intellectually and politically. You know, what we talk about over radio, what we write about in newspapers, and what we blog about. And there's the other reality of what is actually happening in the ground in Palestine. To talk about two-state solution uh, and actually trying to understand the topography of the occupation, the demographics, how involved both Jews and Arabs are in their, in, 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 in their everyday life. To talk about two-state solution that is going to guarantee some sort of racial supremacy of one or create some sort of segregation between ethnicities and races is absolutely impossible. No one can look at the map of the West Bank and Jerusalem and Israel. I mean, just look at the Palestinians within Israel itself. Nearly two million Palestinians living in Israel. These are Palestinians who have never left after Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in 1948. It's just an impossible scenario to create a two-state solution that is based on ethnicity. The fact is, this is something that we talk about because politically, the Americans, the Europeans, the UN they are politically bankrupt. They don't really have anything else. They know that the two-state solution is over. It only exists on paper. It only exists at some sort of a intellectual level, but it doesn't exist in reality. But to accept the fact that it no longer exists, it means to have to contend with a very harsh reality for them. And that is for Palestinians and Israelis to coexist somehow. And for that to happen, Netanyahu has decided that this is tantamount to the destruction of the Jewish state. And nobody wants to venture out to that, to that level. So we talk about something that doesn't exist because we are afraid to embrace and to discuss the reality on the ground and what is, in fact, possible at this point. Which is what? Because it seems like if things play out in the obvious way, where at some point there are just so many more Palestinians than Israeli Jews, that at that point it will at least be a, a real, if it's not already, I understand how people would say it is already, I'm not saying it's not, but at that point it'll be basically consensus that Israel has annexed the West Bank, that it is part of Israel proper, and now it's a minority Jewish population ruling over the Palestinians. At that point, if it's a one state, if, if all the pressure is on the Israeli Jews to go ahead and side with democracy, over having a Jewish majority and a permanent permanent Jewish state there, or, or, or permanent well, you know, majority I mean, Jewish I mean, run I mean, state there, won't there just be a civil war? Because they're not going to go for that. Well, I, I hope not. I mean, it's the moral thing to do. I mean, imagine if we... Well, I don't think there's the any US doubt about that. I just fear the worst, that they would say, actually, we'll just do another Nakba if it comes to that, because we're sure as hell not going right. to give you majority power here. That's true, and, and, and we understand that this is something that, is, that has to be phased out. It's something that cannot be imposed, and it requires a great deal of cultural dialogue, political dialogue, and it has to be phased out on the course maybe of an entire generation. But the, but the issue is this. Currently, right now, between the River Jordan and, and the Mediterranean Sea, there are Jews and Arabs who are living and sharing the same space. They are sharing water. They are sharing the, the hills of the West Bank and the Galilee. 
they are they, they are everywhere. I mean, not one single town in 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 Israel, and not one single place in the West Bank in the, that that is vacant of a mix of Arabs and Jews. But but the the problem is the kind of, of laws that govern this mass of people is unfair and it's racist, and and this is the issue. So it's really it it, it may sound appear to be a giant task. But in reality, it's all about rewriting the laws to give each citizen, each person, each resident of that space between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea um, equal rights. It's, it's really that, that much of a challenge. And of course, the mentality that rules Israel right now, that of Netanyahu and others, will not accept that. But just the fact that they will not accept that, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't push for it. It's the same way that we pushed for, for the end of apartheid in South Africa, despite the fact that, that, that all odds were against us, and, and yet somehow those who pushed for that sort of change prevailed at the end of the day. This is the kind of change we hope to achieve in Palestine as well. Right. Well, I mean, just look at the fact that we haven't even wasted time talking about these stupid talks, because they're nothing but fake, stupid talks anyway. Why even waste time talking about that? You know what I'll talk about instead? I'll, I'll make a suggestion. Um that instead of apartheid, or interchangeable with apartheid, but I'm just saying since everybody wants to cry boo-hoo about apartheid, you know what would be about the term apartheid, not the the reality of it, which is worth crying about. Um, But uh, they cry about the term. Uh, What would be more effective in America anyway would be to make direct comparisons to the old South and the old Jim Crow way of doing things, because that's one thing that Americans are actually really proud of, is that it's not like that anymore. We got a lot of racism, we got a lot of problems, but Jim Crow is over. And if you compare it to that, it's a direct comparison. And Americans, they can't even find South Africa on a map, dude, anyway. So you might as well say, this is like Mississippi in the battle days. Now do you understand? And they will understand. Absolutely. I agree with you, Scott. And, you know, but it also it's important to remember that it took Americans a long, long time to reach where they are right now. And still there right. are so many challenges to overcome. Right. So, so that, that's why but, we... But Americans' opinions about this that. situation is pretty much going to have to change before very much can change over there, you know? That's right. I agree. Uh, and it, it's just, you know, and I'll tell you another thing, too, as long as I'm telling you stuff instead of asking you stuff. Um, I think most Americans don't understand that there's an occupation of that. There is a war. And then this territory that was foreign territory has been occupied, but the people still live there. They're just under a foreign martial law for almost 50 years now. I don't think they understand that. I think they think that Palestine is already the country next door. So I think that there's a lot of. Uh, you know, maybe there's, they're confused about why you would need a two state solution or whatever, but they never had anyone to iron it out for them. So I think a lot of education on the very basic level is really important, you know, in there's these no borders. There's no question about it, of course. Yeah, I of mean, course. I think everybody else in the world pretty much gets it as, as far as I can tell from, from what I read, but around here, no. That is true. I am, I'm talking to you from, from London right now and, and, uh, you know, you never have to contend with these kind of questions, the kind of debates that we have in the universities and the media. Much of this is already understood that the debate is at a much more advanced level. In the U.S., it remains a very big challenge. And I, you know, I could go on and on to talk about the media and the propaganda and all of that. But there is a lot of work that we need to do ourselves to change that. Right. And I'm sorry for saving this till the end, and we're almost completely out of time, but in just about half a minute or so, could you talk about the humanitarian situation in Gaza and whether it's gotten any better at all? It actually got worse with the uh, after the Sisi overthrew Mohammed Morsi and punished Hamas uh, for their affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. So that uh, kind of line that, that, that only that available uh, respite for Palestinians was closed when Sisi came to power. The situation got a lot worse. Now the hope is that because of Sisi's affiliation with Mahmoud Abbas in, in the West Bank, hopefully there will be a little bit of some opening, some, some margin, where, where he would allow for the border between Gaza and Egypt to open up. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I sure appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Sorry, we have Bye. to leave it here. That's Ramsey Baroud, everybody. He writes at palestinechronicle.com. And uh, you can find him at antiwar.com today. Palestinian unity, hope and gloom in the beach refugee camp. Thanks for listening. See you all next week.
Hey, Al Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make the show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Edited by libertarian purist Sheldon Richmond, the Future of Freedom brings you the best of our movement. Featuring articles by Richmond, Jacob Hornberger, James Bovard, and many more, the Future of Freedom stands for peace and liberty and against our criminal world empire and Leviathan State. Subscribe today. It's just $25 per year for the back pocket size print edition, $15 per year to read it online. That's the Future of Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. Peace and freedom. Thank you. The military industrial complex, the disastrous rise of misplaced power. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. I'd like for you to read this book, The War State by Michael Swanson. America's always gone to war a lot, though in older times it would disarm for a bit between each one. But in World War II, the U.S. built a military and intelligence apparatus so large, it ended up reducing the former constitutional government to an almost ceremonial role and converting our economy into an engine of destruction. In the war state, Michael Swanson does a great job telling the sordid history of the rise of this national security state, relying on important first-hand source material, but writing for you and me. Find out how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all alternately empowered and fought to control this imperial beast, and how the USA has gotten to where it is today. Corrupt, bankrupt, soaked in blood, despised by the world. The War State by Michael Swanson, available at Amazon.com and at Audible.com. Or just click the logo in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org. We should take nothing for granted. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for wallstreetwindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop. Which is, by the way, what he's doing right now. Selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at wallstreetwindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com